Welcome to the Art of Feeling Better podcast today's session, carrying on with the theme of education. Uh, now, last week I had the pleasure of speaking to Chris Jones. I have another few guests coming up over the next couple of sessions, and we also have um, a webinar that I'll be speaking at around reimagining education and unlocking the keys to education. So I just wanted to carry on. This is my little solo one today. I wanted to carry on the conversation around education because it's, it's, I'm so passionate about the subject and I've had many conversations over the years with many, many people um, and, and I've witnessed lots of conversations on group chats, on parent sites, on um, working with young people over the years that I have done. Um, it's such a topic that we need to be discussing out in the open, but it's just so difficult. It's so difficult. And I think I'm at the point now where and we really have to bring these situations and these issues into the room at a high scale. We have to influence and change collectively as human beings, as parents, as students, as teachers, um, because the system has to change. The system has to change. There is no way it can't. And every area of work that I do and every person that I speak to, regardless of whether they have a connection to education or not, um, has been impacted by the education system. And a lot of the issues that we're finding now, and you know, I diversify and I, I've got fingers in lots of pies and I seem to do lots of different things. My, I, mean, I work with mental health is my big thing and, and supporting people through trauma recovery. Um, my spiritual stuff that I do to support people is the same thing in a different way. And the more work I do with individuals, and you, if you're watching this, you're probably going to resonate. When we wind it back to the problem and the root cause and something that's causing the, the, the issue, 99.9% of the time, it will be part of the learning environment of being a child, feeling inadequate, feeling stupid. Um, I'm not creative. I'm not sporty. I'm, I'm, it, it's something that has been programmed in at, at, at an early age and generally speaking attached to schooling experience. So I've been working with this for years now thinking, well, that big, how do we understand this? And, and it's coming into the room a lot more now. A lot of teachers are really picking up on it because a lot of teachers are becoming damaged by being in a system that doesn't work and going into it to help young people and then recognising they're part of the problem of damaging young people. How horrible is that, you know, having to be in that role? So I thought a good topic just to chat about now because we've got, it's such a big thing of going gone forever and ever. I just want to talk about how we learn. Right? How we learn. Because for me, once we can uncover and think about this small little thing, it should open the doors for everything else, right? So I'm, I'm chatting to Chris last week about measurement. You know, what is it we're measuring? We've got the metrics wrong. We're measuring attainment. We're measuring you know, how children regurgitate information. But how is that an indicator of a successful, happy or fulfilled life? Well, it isn't at all, is it? Um, and that's becoming more and more widely known now. So how do we learn? How do we learn? Well, one of the things that I, many years ago when I did my leadership and management degree, we were doing lots of tools around how to effectively manage. And one of them was around learning styles. Now, a load of you might already know all about this and you might have different, you know, there's different models that are used um, to, to assess this. You'll have different things in the workplace. But the fundamentals are the same. We all have a different way of learning, right? So some of us are very visual learners. Some of us are really good with reading and writing. Some of us are very good with audio and we need to be told, we need to hear something in order to be able to do it. And some of us are what's called kinesthetic learners or practical learners and we need to be able to do it, watch someone do it and do it with them. Now that's it, this is widely known, right? Widely known. And yet our education system is not at all set up for any kinesthetic learners. And every young person, every every single one of the years I work with in isolation rooms or you know the, the naughty kids that have been kicked out into a group somewhere else, I have done creative personality types and learning style assessments, little quizzes, to assess what's going on. And every single one has been dominant kinesthetic. The way they learn in their brains is by, by doing something active. One of my children is a good example of this. He's had a horrific time through the education system for that reason. So if you imagine, we have these schools and they're set up and this machine is just running and nobody can stop it. And this is the way we do things. And it just is what it is. You have to 
attain things and you have to hit these measurements and that's it and if you don't then there is something wrong with you well i again head up the parapet challenge that and say well hang on a minute no there isn't anything wrong with anybody at all the failing is with the system because you're not engaging somebody the way that they operate so it's the environment that's wrong not the person and all the people that i meet believe that there is something wrong with them because the environment is so shitty and doesn't help them with what they need and yet there is no solution other than to be told that well you feel fault you're broken you're you know something wrong with you so it's my life's work now to just challenge it because it's just such an awful thing to be part of and it's an awful thing to witness when you can see there's something going on and you can see the failings but you can't do anything about it so i'm just gonna get loud and noisy which is don't change there is it really so Think about that in terms of learning styles and we're thinking i've been doing a lot of work filming lately for mojo school and, and uh, yeah i haven't told you about that yet but brand new platform that we're working on um and i've been doing a little bit of work around uh, maslow within mindset mojo and anybody that's heard of maslow's hierarchy of needs some people will know it back to front some people will never have heard of it there's a triangle with levels of what we need in order to self-actualize and live our best lives and be our best selves and teachers, when I did my, my basic teacher training, it's one of the first things you, you learn. But it seems like everybody forgets it because we, don't, we then don't refer back to it. So we know we need things like oxygen and food and water to survive. No shit, Sherlock. Yeah, we know that. We know that we need security, stability. We know that we need a mortgage. We know that we need to get a job and hold on a job. Yes, we know that. But nobody can seem to articulate any of the other stuff. Social connections, the creativity, problem solving, the emotional connections. These are the things that we really need to be happy individuals. But we're just taught, do that and then you should be happy. And if you're not, you're a problem. Do that and do it the way I tell you to do it. Otherwise, there's something wrong with you and you're stupid. And you all have to pretend that you're, you're all right with it because that's the way it is. And everybody else is getting on with it. And they're all happy on their social media. So why are you a problem? And we've got this horrible, perpetuating, awful society uh, that's getting worse and worse with, with the digital age now. And we have these young people, these children, who have, the, our brains are evolving because this digital capability and all of the stuff that goes with you know, evolving in this way is sparking off new creativity and new things and new identity issues that you know, we, were never there before. And yet we then plonk them into Victorian and post-war setups in schools. We tell them that that's right, but we also tell them that they need to go and do that over there. We tell them that they have to learn this way because that's the proper way to learn. And if it doesn't feel right in your body, you just pretend it does and just ignore that. We don't do feelings, we don't do emotions, we don't do anger for sure. So crack on, get on with it. And we have these brains, these, these Ferrari, if it's a good analogy for ADHD, Ferrari brains with bicycle brakes. It's just going off in all different directions. This amazing creative superpower capability that is being thwarted and stunted and bashed out of people um, as something that is wrong or bad or needs medicating or needs assessing to be labelled as something bad and then medicated. And don't get me wrong, you know, I don't want, I know they'll be kicked back from that because it's a necessary thing and I know we need this. And a lot of people I work with, that just being able to, to have that label to get the support and to, is, is amazing. But you can see where the damage is, right? You can see that it's very, very negative connotations to all, all of these labels where we need to be to be looking at embracing diversity and difference and being inclusive and having a space or spaces where everybody can learn everybody gets the chance to learn and they learn however it works for them so i would love to be able to see you know and, and i think it's you know maybe maybe in my lifetime maybe not but a place where the whole education system has a complete flip reframe overhaul where there are different spaces there are different spaces set up and there, and i speak to teachers all the time especially like little school teachers who they could pretty much assess from a very early age and they could tell who needs you know who responds better to certain things and who could be where so you know these assessment better kind of assessments which aren't making people feel like crap if they can't perform a certain task on a certain day 
because they okay you learn really well from you love reading and writing brilliant your your space is there you'll do really well there i know your kind of subject so oh, you need to go there that's your way to learn nothing's worse than nothing's better than there's just difference right and all difference is celebrated that's what that's what it should be because we have this alternative provision don't we which i'm in that arena where it's like if you can't if you can't be be great and do all that stuff that you're meant to do then we'll just throw you in that corner and it means you're a bit stupid a bit crap and you won't probably won't get very far uh, excuse me i just that needs to be packed in immediately because it's just incorrect we can't keep using this kind of language and we can't keep having this kind of framework it's just abusive and damaging unacceptable completely unacceptable and i've been doing some training recently i've been doing loads but i'm always retraining and relearning and reading books and trying to like a sponge for the knowledge but i was reading um the human giving institute book so i've done a fair bit of training over the last couple of years with, with some of their courses and there was a really interesting passage around human brain, which is how I love the human brain. And it was talking about language, right? It was talking about why, why is it that little kids, you could put little kids in a family where there are more than one language and they would be bilingual. They just pick up language really quickly, yeah? Oh, wow, that's an interesting, interesting. And it turns out on my pursuit for more neuroscience information that there are certain how do we put this so it's easy to understand? Certain programs that are online at certain ages, right? Certain things that need to come online in order for a human being to, to, to match up with its environment and to be able to form bonds, form attachments, find its space. So these brain waves, these brain wave states are conducive to certain aspects of learning, right? So if you need to have that sponge learning and you need to learn language so that you can fit in with your community, that you can communicate with your caregivers, then that makes perfect sense to me that that would be the dominant brainwave pattern of a very small child. So it's all, and it's all coding. I will go in, I'll do a deeper one on this at some point and I'll get some experts in to, to talk through it with me, but it is all coding, isn't it? So if you think about uh, a young person learning languages and all of the brain power that will take up and all that brain energy, it has to work in a certain way, it's a certain program, right, that's switched on. And then it's switched back on again when it's not needed anymore. Oh, did I just put that on there? And then it's switched back off again when it's not needed anymore. And it turns out that when we're young, we have a program that is the ability to learn how to learn, right? That's not how to learn geography, it's not how to learn mathematics it's the ability to learn how we learn and we find our when you see kids doing it you see toddlers doing it they watch they observe they look at what people are doing more than what they're saying and they adapt and they learn so that program is switched on learning how to learn to adapt to grow to, to evolve and then apparently at the age of 11 how coincidental that program flips. So that's why it's so hard to learn language when you get older, because that program just isn't there anymore. You should have done all that learning. You should have learned how to learn in those formative years when you're at home with your caregivers. And then you should go out, you've got your learning style, you know how you learn, then you need to go out having experiences from age 11 that will, that will help you evolve and move into different spaces and places. Now we throw our young people into this space, age 11, where they are told that they have to learn in a certain way, whether their program switched off or not. And how awful would that be? And I, you know, I have seen it all the time where kids are really trying to be good, good, trying to be good. Their brains will not let them. Their brains aren't set up that way. Their program is completely different. Their software doesn't operate in that system. So how awful to be trying to adapt and trying to work in a world that doesn't work for you. And while you're doing that, be constantly told there's something wrong with you and that you're stupid or that you're bad or you're never going to get anywhere. No wonder we have task avoidance and teachers up and down the country will understand this where you have more and more and more young people throwing chairs through windows or fighting or trying to get themselves sent out because they cannot do the task. It is less embarrassing to be cool outside the head's office or in the ISO, in ISO than it is to be shown up as being stupid or an idiot or not smart enough because you can't understand and your program doesn't work with the way that you are being taught in a classroom. The majority of this is obviously read right, isn't it? We look at, but look at this, sit there, don't be distracted. Just focus on one thing at a time and it's words and it's reading and it's writing and that's the way we do things. 
can you see how this damage, absolute harm is being done to people that lasts an absolute lifetime? You know, if your dominant learning style is kinesthetic and you cannot get that, you just can't do that unless you're going to go out, get out of your environment and learn a different way. That's really, really damaging, really damaging. And hopefully that's the kind of thing that we'll be able to, to work on, having these different spaces that are good for different and learning style and as Chris said what's the metric what are we measuring are we measuring someone's ability to regurgitate and spew out some information they've learned about Henry VIII so that they can be told that they're smart or are we measuring someone's ability to engage in, and within their community or create something or be part of a community or a team or a project or give something back or help somebody else and be a great parent what are we measuring and and finally now I might, I'll get off my soapbox in a minute. I am just going to bring it back to a question that I've asked. I think I mentioned this actually yes, last week, but I want to say it again. Is I, I keep asking people the same thing all the time when it comes to these conversations around education because clearly I don't really look like somebody who's a professional in, it, in education, so I mustn't know anything. And I'm always asking, like, oh, I understand the principles, I understand how the system works, and I understand that the need for higher education, further education, and I get it. I understand the concept, right? Go high school. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a visual learner, but I also am all right with read, right? So I was one of the lucky ones. So why are we doing it? Why, why, why is always my question. Why do we need to get good grades? If that's, if we're looking at metrics, why do we need to measure our ability to retain and then regurgitate information on a piece of paper in an exam condition, in a highly stressful exam condition? Well, it's so that you can prove that you're smart. That for starters is ridiculous, but okay, let's say, so you can get these grades that we've set that says that you are good enough to do something else. All right, okay, fair enough. So what, what's the purpose in that then? Why do we do that? Well, if you do that, then you get to go to another classroom environment, another establishment, sixth form or college, that will put you in a boxy room where you are in rows like you're going to a factory and somebody bigger than you is at the front telling you that you're telling you what's right and wrong and you just remember it. And then we'll test you on that again and, we'll, and you can, will tell you whether you're good enough at remembering that information. Huh, saying why? What are we doing that for? Well, then that means you can get to university um, and everybody wants to strive that linear path of you have to do that, that and that. If you are one of the good people in society, that's the path you take. Otherwise, you're just one of the idiots. University is the end game. Get there. But then we'll put you in another one of those classroom environments, but we'll put extra pressure on now. It's like, whew, you've got to be able to really deal with stress at this point and regurgitate information, lots of it, lots of words, with tight deadlines. Okay, all right, maybe that's teaching you how to deal with stress, how to do, you know, I can, I can kind of see yeah, maybe prepping you for adult life-ish, kind of. Why, though, why? What does that mean? Well, that means when you get your, you know, your, your degree, that means you're going to get the best possible job. You're going to have more chances of getting you, you know, growing your CV, you're going to have a better chance than the stupid people over there at getting a job that pays the money. Huh, all right, now we're getting somewhere, aren't we? All right, I understand how that works. I don't like it, but I understand. So why? Why do we want to get a good job? Why do we want to get the most of the job with the most money? Is it so we can have power over people? Is it status? That's money, isn't it? You want more money so that you can do things. Okay. Once again, why? Why do we want the best job with the most money? Why? Well, because then you can live a happy life. Hmm. To see the fundamental flaw in that plan? If you are constantly not taught how to deal with pressure as a more able and talented, more able and talented, clever, as opposed to the stupid lot, then there's a good chance that you're going to end up not having a happy life because then you have these bizarre trauma responses that tell you you have to do more, be more, be perfect, have status, have more money, more, 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 be better, and you're not going to be happy. Or you're going to have a harder time being happy. Or you're not even going to get that far because you're too stupid and you're told that you're not good enough to be happy. So you're not going to be happy anyway. So why, why this disconnect? If all we want to do is be happy, if that's the end goal of everything, is to have a happy, well-fulfilled life so that when we're in our 70s, we can retire and actually smile. If that's what we're going for, then I think we should be teaching people how to be happy. We should be teaching people the fundamental skills in being compassionate, kind, empathic, enjoying life, having great experiences, managing situations that come up when they're not great because that's life. 
enjoying the best bits, dealing with the worst bits, supporting each other, supporting our family, being great parents, passing on wisdom, supporting our community, helping to learn and grow and shape things, sharing skills, sharing wisdom, making enough resource so that we can all contribute and that we can all get something back, that we can survive and we can eat and we can have shelter. So that we can build in those bits of Maslow's pyramid. That is what we should be being taught in schools. Real life skills. How to be happy. That is the end of my rant for the day. Next week I'm going to have another incredible person to talk a little bit more around their work within education. And hopefully some of these conversations will start to gain traction and we'll get in the right rooms with the right people who can make the decisions. We're coming for you. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.